the speaker is Peter Barnes. So Peter is going to talk about uh, present and future therapies for COPD. Peter is a professor of medicine, thoracic medicine at the National Heart and Lung Institute in the uh, UK. And uh, he's head of the respiratory division at Imperial College. Uh, he's been around a while. He's published, uh, <laughs> he's published more, more than more than a thousand papers and has an impact factor, the H factor, if, if those of you who follow the H factor, it's like, uh, you know, somebody's scoring in hockey, his H factor is 140, uh, which is big, that's a big H factor. And uh, he was recently elected to the, the as a fellow of the, of the Royal Society in the UK, and he's the first respiratory scientist in 150 years that have been elected. Uh, and the last one was a guy named Henry Salter, who first described asthma. So he's in a very select group. Hen Henry Salter just died last year, so. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, thank you very much, Peter. And I want to start by congratulating Jim for the Gardner Award. This is an absolutely outstanding distinction. And such international awards are very rare in pulmonary research. So I think uh, it's very well deserved, but a, a wonderful honor and a recognition of all his contributions. Uh, for many years, Jim has been a role model for me a collaborator and a friend, but he probably doesn't remember the first time we met, which was the first international meeting I went to, which was the ATS in Los Angeles in 1981. And I think I had a poster there, and he was really nice to me, very friendly, and he asked me questions, and he was interested in my research. And you always remember when people that are so important are nice to you, because most people that are important are not nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always grateful for that. So I, I always get the last talk. So usually the other speakers are leaving as I get up to speak. But it, it is important to um, discuss the implications of research on current and future therapy. And these are my potential conflicts of interest, which I'm aiming to expand as much as I can. Uh, I just point out the spin-out company, Respivert. I'm going to come back to that because we've actually discovered a molecule. Um, so we've heard from Dennis about the importance of air trapping in COPD. So in normal people, alveolar gas is emptied and there's no significant air trapping. But because of the pathology of COPD with the narrowed, thickened airways, and the loss of alveolar attachments, which are the consequence of inflammation, uh, this airway narrowing on expiration leads to closure, which traps air in the alveoli, uh, leading to hyperinflation, which seems to be a very important lesion of COPD and gets worse with exercise. So this leads to, this connects the pathology of COPD with the symptoms, which is what we're concerned about. Um, and the mainstay of treatment today is long-acting bronchodilators. And these work by relaxing small human airways, which express M3 muscarinic receptors and beta-2 receptors. And so we can treat this air trapping with two types of bronchodilator, long-acting muscarinic antagonists, of which teotropium has been around for the longest, but now there are some others, or long-acting beta agonists. And in general, these drugs are equally effective, which is quite different from asthma, where long-acting beta agonists are always more effective than LAMA. And that's because in asthma, there are many constrictor elements uh, such as inflammatory mediators like leukotrienes and prostaglandins. In COPD, if these drugs are the same, it means the only reversible component in COPD is cholinergic tone. And that's why you see LAMA and LABA coming to be similar. So we've had teotropium for a long time, which is an effective uh, long-acting bronchodilator with the convenience of once-daily administration. And now there are other drugs coming, so glycopyrrolate, 
is a very old drug, and you can see it's got a very similar time course to teotropium and is similarly, similarly efficacious. Actually, Trevor Hansel and I first showed that inhaled glycopyrrolate was a long-acting drug, but stupidly, we didn't patent this, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be somewhere in the Caribbean, relaxing. <laughs> Uh, so this was subsequently developed by Novartis and is now on the market. So if you compare teotropium with Alama Salmeterol, which is given twice a day, it turns out that teotropium is more effective. This is measuring redu uh, reduction of exacerbations, particularly in severe exacerbations. And that may be not because these classes of drug are different, but because they have different durations of action, because salmeterol needs to be given twice a day, whereas teotropium is effective once a day. And the key to treating COPD is to have sustained bronchodilatation. Um, and here you can see indicatorol, which is a once a day beta agonist, is more effective than salmeterol, a twice a day beta agonist. And in other studies, it's been shown that indicatorol and teotropium are exactly equivalent. Uh, so it's not the class of drug, but the duration of action that is key. So the main thrust of drug development is rather boring because it's basically been improving the drugs we already know are working. This is the safe approach of the pharmaceutical industry. This is how they make money, not by innovation, but by repetition. And we have ultralabas, which are once a day beta agonists, and you've seen that endocaterol is better than salmeterol. Uh, but there are other once-a-day larvas like Volantarol, Olodaterol, Abideterol, and there are lots of these drugs because they're easy to find. You know what you're looking for. It's the same is true for llamas. So we have new llamas like Aclidinium, Glycopyrrolate, Eumeclidinium, and then we have combination of larvas and llamas. Or we have marvas, uh, which are dual function molecules that are muscarinic antagonists and beta agonists. But what's been difficult to find is new classes of bronchodilator, although people have looked extensively because it's rather easy to uh, look at relaxation of airway smooth muscle. So you can look at um, this in in vitro studies. It's a classical pharmacological preparation. And we do have new bronchodilators um, like potassium channel openers. But the problem with these uh, including the most interesting drugs of all, which are the smooth muscle myosin inhibitors, which actually have more bronchodilator effect than beta agonists. The trouble is that they all relax blood vessels, so they have vasodilator side effects, which means they cause headache and postural hypotension. So they're not useful drugs to give by mouth. It's possible they could work by inhalation, but um, so far this has not been demonstrated. And an, an unexpected target is the bitter taste receptor, TAS2R, uh, which recognizes bitter substances like quinine, and these receptors are expressed in human airway smooth muscle and cause relaxation. But these drugs are not very potent bronchodilators, so it's actually been very disappointing to find new bronchodilators, and so we stick with larvas and llamas. In fact, the obvious thing is to combine larvas and llamas, and this is where things are going. This is a, a very instructive study uh, where they looked at indicatorol. So the maximum clinical dose that we use is 300 micrograms a day. Um, but in this study, they went up to 600 micrograms a day. Uh, we don't use that clinically because it has significant cardiovascular side effects. So that's why 300 is a cutoff. But the important thing in this study is that 600 doesn't have any greater bronchodilator effect than 300. So you've reached the maximum effect of a beta agonist. And why that's important is that the beta agonist reverses every known bronchoconstrictor mechanism, including cholinergic tone. So you can't possibly expect any further bronchodilatation. But if you add glycopyrrolate, you can see that you double the bronchodilatation. This is totally unexplained. Uh, it's convenient because it means you get more bronchodilatation, and 300 mils bronchodilatation is the biggest bronchodilator response that has ever been seen in a COPD study. 
Uh, but we absolutely don't understand this interaction, and it's very likely related to crosstalk between the signaling pathways of the muscarinic M3 receptor and the beta 2 receptor. But, you know, how it works is not so important as that it's a better bronchodilator. And this is confirmed in longer-term studies, so this study recently published uh, is demonstrating the same thing as that previous study in that Indicatorol and glycopyrrolate have, have similar bronchodilator effects and actually similar to teotropium. But if you combine glycopyrrolate and indicatorol in QVA149, then you can see this additional bronchodilator response, which is quite clear, and is correlated with an additional improvement in symptoms but unfortunately is not very well correlated with a greater reduction in exacerbations. So we don't know how this translates into overall clinical improvement. But nevertheless, it's led to a lot of activity in the pharmaceutical industry because there's money to be made here. So indicatorol glycopyrrolate, now known as Ultibro, I don't know where they get these names, <laughs> but this is almost on the market. Uh, and then you have olodatrol teotropium, which is coming along, and valanterol eumeclidinium, called anoro. So these are all drugs that are in advanced clinical development, so will soon be available and will be the most effective bronchodilators that we have. There are also twice-daily drugs that use formoterol that has to be given twice daily. And then we have MARBAs, which are these dual function molecules. These have been rather unsuccessful because it's very difficult to balance the anticholinergic and the beta agonist effect. So you end up usually with a beta agonist or an anticholinergic. So they're not great drugs. And then the ultimate is the triple, which is everything in one inhaler. So you don't need to think. And this is for GPs. And they would give it to everyone. <laughs> They, they wouldn't care if they had asthma or COPD. But in fact, this would be an extreme waste of money. And most people with COPD don't need a steroid. And most people with asthma don't need an anticholinergic. So I think these are rather a bad idea, but they're coming. Now, many people with COPD, as you'll see later, are treated with a combination of a LABA and a steroid. And the most popular is salmeterol fluticasone, or serotide, which is now the third biggest selling drug in the world of all drugs. And in this study of Visha Vedzicha, you can see that serotide is equivalent to teotropium. And I showed you before that teotropium is better than salmeterol, so it suggests that the fluticasone may be doing something good. And many people believe that inhaled steroids would be useful in COPD because they're very good in asthma, which is an inflammatory disease. And we've already heard that there are some similarities between asthma and COPD in terms of the inflammatory pattern. And so several studies were done to specifically address the issue of whether inhaled steroids reduce disease progression. These studies were uniformly negative and in fact, because people couldn't believe that steroids don't work, even more studies were done. So we now have more than 16,000 COPD patients have been subjected to high-dose inhaled steroids. And there's absolutely no effect on the decline in FUV1 or mortality. Uh, this is one of the large studies, the TORCH study, that probably most of you are familiar with, which has more than 6,000 patients studied for three years. And here you can see that serotide, the purple line, does reduce mortality, although it doesn't quite reach statistical significance. So the relevance of this is really uncertain, especially for such a huge trial. Um, but if you look at steroids alone, you can see that, if anything, they're increasing the mortality. They're certainly not reducing it. And if you analyze these data, as two or three different groups have now done in the correct way, using a factorial analysis, you can see that all of the benefit in mortality and exacerbations is provided by the long-acting beta agonist and not by the steroid. <laughs> 
And we now know that high-dose inhaled steroids given over long periods are detrimental to people with COPD, which is not surprising because we know that high doses of steroids are absorbed from the lungs and have systemic effects. There's a high risk of osteoporosis and fractures, and this has been linked to inhaled steroid use because COPD patients already have a high risk of osteoporosis. There's an increased risk of cataracts, and comorbidities are worsened. For example, new diagnoses of diabetes are much more common in COPD patients treated with inhaled steroids. And something that only came out when large studies were done over a long period is that there's a risk of lung infection. And this has been studied most extensively with pneumonia, but also with tuberculosis. So there's a definite increased risk of getting TB if you're on high-dose inhaled steroids. So you can imagine the impact of this in developing countries where these drugs are now being dished out in huge numbers. There's a 16-fold increase in the risk of developing non-tuberculous mycobacterial lung disease. But it's pneumonia that is causing most concern and really first came to light in the TORCH study because this was a long study going on over three years where you can see that both the serotide and the fluticasone group had increased pneumonia. But it took time for these lines to separate because this is something that is slowly developing. And Sami Suisa uh, from Montreal has, has done a very important and observational analysis on more than 160,000 COPD patients and has shown that there's a marked risk of pneumonia, uh, particularly in the patients with severe, uh, with high doses. And fluticasone is much more likely to cause pneumonia than budesonide. Now, we, we don't know the reasons for this, but it's very likely that the fluticasone is worse because it's retained in the lung for longer, and it may suppress both innate and acquired immunity so that the bacteria that are often colonizing the lungs of COPD patients then are growing up, uh, leading to pneumonia. But one interesting statistic is that you only need to treat 17 patients with COPD to get pneumonia, but you need to treat 44 patients with COPD to prevent one exacerbation. So that's an important statistic to bear in mind. So how should we use inhaled steroids? Well, the simple answer is less. We should use it to treat associated asthma and about 10% of COPD patients have features of asthma. We heard a bit about that in Ed's talk, so this TH2 signature. And they probably have concomitant asthma and COPD. So they're both very common diseases. Uh, we know that steroids have no significant effect on inflammation in marked contrast to their anti-inflammatory effects in asthma. No effect on disease progression. The reduction in severe exacerbations is quite small. And Sami Suisa believes it's an artifact of poor trial design. If you take steroid-naive patients, you can't show any reduction of exacerbations with steroids. And a recent study um, where patients were taken off inhaled steroids showed that there was no increase in exacerbations. So probably inhaled steroids are being used for the wrong reason. But the big problem is that they have adverse effects which have not yet been fully appreciated because it takes a long time for these adverse effects to develop. And of course, inhaled steroids are expensive. So in the gold strategy, it's recommended that we should use corticosteroids for patients with severe disease, which means FEV1 less than 50%, to have frequent exacerbations, which means two or more a year. And this is about 10% of all COPD patients. But currently, more than 80% of patients with COPD are treated with high-dose inhaled steroids, particularly fluticasone. And this is a study from Spain showing that if you've got an FEV1 of less than 50%, you can see 107% of patients are on inhaled steroids because some people get inhaled combination and steroids separately. 
But what's worse, I mean, that's bad, but this worse is that people with an FEV1 more than 50% who should not be given steroids, this is in, not in any guidelines. So you see that 82% of them are getting high-dose inhaled steroids. This is absolutely disgraceful. And it's, the, the figures in the UK are probably even worse than in Spain. And it's a great triumph of marketing over science. So the use of high-dose inhaled steroids for COPD needs to be markedly reduced in the future. So the question is, could we make steroids work? And I'm going to address that at the end. Or are there alternative anti-inflammatory treatments? And to look at this, we need to understand the nature of inflammation. And I won't go through all this, but there's lots of inflammatory cells and mediators involved in the complex pathophysiology of COPD. But these inflammatory mechanisms can account for small airway fibrosis, alveolar wall destruction, and mucus hypersecretion. So we believe that inflammation is driving the disease, and we need effective anti-inflammatory treatments. The problem is that this inflammation is steroid resistant, which means we need new anti-inflammatory treatments. And that's been a problem. So we have to look at this inflammation in more detail. The best thing would be not to smoke, but smoking cessation is difficult because the treatments that we have now to stop nicotine addiction are very poor. So even with the best treatment, only 15% of COPD smokers stop smoking. And these treatments, in any case, have side effects. You can block inflammatory mediators, but there are hundreds of mediators in COPD, so picking the right one is a problem. You can block the proteases, and that's proved to be very, very difficult in terms of finding drugs that can do this safely. Uh, a more general approach is to give a broad-spectrum anti-inflammatory treatment, and there is some success in this area. Uh, to inhibit the fibrosis. We don't have any antifibrotic drugs for any human disease. Uh, drugs that stop mucus hypersecretion, but the, so far this has not been possible. Uh, or drugs that even repair alveolar damage, which is something that you can do in rodents, but seems not to be in humans. So we think there are three strategies for treating inflammation in COPD. The first is to block specific mediators. This has been very successful in some diseases like rheumatoid arthritis where anti-TNF and anti-IL-6 have been very effective therapy for severe disease. But anti-TNF is completely ineffective. In fact, it's detrimental in COPD. And the problem is there are too many mediators. So if you block one mediator, there are lots of others that do the same thing. The second strategy, which is more likely to work, is that you have a broad-spectrum anti-inflammatory drug. We want the equivalent of steroids in asthma, which have been remarkably successful. And we do have such a drug now on the market, which is a PDE4 inhibitor. But these drugs, at least when given by mouth, have a lot of side effects. And the third strategy, which I think is the most interesting, uh, is that you might reverse, <laughs> reverse the steroid resistance because then you could give steroids in low doses, which would be quite safe. And we can do this with existing drugs. I'm going to use the example of theophylline, but theophylline is cheap, and therefore it's impossible to get funding to study it. So I'm going to start with one example that looked like the most promising example of a mediator antagonist, and this is a chemokine receptor antagonist. And... The interesting chemokines of COPD are the ones that attract neutrophils and monocytes. And IL-8 is a, very well known to you as a neutrophil mediator. But the most important, I mean the one that's most highly elevated in COPD is GROW-alpha and also NR78. But they all work on a common receptor, CXCR2. Uh, and the attraction of chemokine receptors is that they're G-protein coupled receptors for which you can find small molecule antagonists. So, you know, for beta receptors, we have beta blockers. Uh, histamine receptors, you have antihistamines. And so this is a promising approach. And many small molecule CXCR2 antagonists have been developed. But there are other chemokine receptors that are also involved in recruitment of different cells. And again, small molecule uh, antagonists have been developed, but not yet tested in COPD. So that the most advanced is CXCR2, 
And these drugs have now been tested. Um, so the idea is that these chemokines, which are all increased in COPD, are recruiting neutrophils into the lung uh, through this common receptor CXCR2. And this can be blocked. Uh, an example I'm going to show you is a drug called Navarixin. And this is a study of Helga Magnusson um, looking at sputum neutrophils. And you can see that the patients treated with Navarixin tablets um, by mouth show a progressive reduction in sputum neutrophils, which is exactly what the drug is supposed to achieve. And this is quite a good, this is a 50% reduction. So it's, pretty, it's the best anti-inflammatory effect that's ever been seen in COPD. So people were quite excited about the prospects of this, and there was some increase in lung function and other medias reduced, but it was a small study, so these were not very significant changes. Uh, and this led to long-term studies, which unfortunately have failed. There's no clinical improvement, no reduction in exacerbations, and some people get a marked neutropenia, uh, which makes the drug potentially dangerous, and so the development has now been stopped. So that was the most promising mediator antagonist. But I think the answer is to have a broad spectrum anti-inflammatory drug because there are so many inflammatory mediators and pathways that we need to have something that has many effects. And this is a list of some of the broad spectrum anti-inflammatory treatments that are currently in clinical development for COPD. And the problem with all of them is that they have a considerable side effects when given by mouth. So it may be that these drugs have to be optimized for inhaled delivery so that they're retained in the lung. Now, PD-4 inhibitors are ideally suited as COPD treatments because they inhibit every inflammatory cell that is involved in COPD. And in animal models, they inhibit the development of emphysema, mucus hypersecretion, they, they are perfect. But in COPD patients, they're not. And it took a long time with several negative studies to realize that some patients responded better than others. And a particular responder phenotype was defined that had severe COPD with frequent exacerbations and mucus hypersecretion or chronic bronchitis. So those were the patients that looked the best. And then those patients were then studied in a, in a new study, or in fact two studies that are combined. Uh, and you can see that with reflumilast, there is about a 50 mil increase in FEV1, which is highly significant because this study is looking at 1,500 patients in each group. So, I mean, you've got 3,000 people, so anything would be significant. But 50 mils is not much, and people don't recognize a 50 mil increase doesn't impact on their symptoms. But the reason the drug got approved in some countries, not the UK, by the way, uh, is that it reduces exacerbations. And this is on top of other treatments. So there is something here, uh, but there's no effect on symptoms or quality of life. So patients don't feel better on reflumilast. And they often feel worse because side effects are extremely common, particularly diarrhea, but also nausea, headache, weight loss. And it's said that no patient has ever gone back for a second prescription. <laughs> so the drug is doing very badly, but it may have a place because at least it's an anti-inflammatory drug, unlike steroids. So it could substitute for steroids in those places where steroids are recommended. And the way around it is to try and develop a drug that you give by inhalation, which is exactly what was done with steroids because of the side effects of systemic steroids. And there are three inhaled PD-4 inhibitors. And the good news is that they don't have any side effects, but the bad news is they don't have any effect. <laughs> but now there are more. There are more coming. And I've seen one that looks all right. I mean, well, I say all right, but it, it had something changing. So people have switched to other targets. I mean, particularly kinases, which are kinase pathways are activated in COPD. Uh, 
And the most popular target is P38 MAP kinase, which is involved in inflammatory gene expression. It's markedly activated in the lungs of COPD patients, particularly in macrophages. Uh, and there are several small molecule inhibitors, and we've studied some of them here. And you can see that they inhibit the release of TNF from COPD macrophages. So they have the right characteristics for anti-inflammatory treatments. But now they've gone into COPD patients in clinical trial, and this is one called Losmapimod, uh, which is given by mouth twice a day. And you can see it had no significant effect on sputum neutrophils, but I think when the study is performed as badly as this one with these error bars, I don't think any drug in the world could work. <laughs> The problem of doing multi-center trials with sputum analysis. But anyway, in things, in things that are more reliable, it, it was also uh, disappointing. So there were no clinical improvements, basically. Um, but it was well tolerated, and that's probably because the dose was too low. As you find with these. But there's a history of oral P38 in inhibitors, um, you know, we always get the cast-offs from other disease areas where things are failing. And they failed in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, where they were used much earlier because they have toxicity, and particularly liver toxicity, they cause skin rashes. Uh, and the thing that's really striking is that they lose efficacy with time, which is the main reason they've stopped the development completely in rheumatoid arthritis. And the reason for that is that you get escape pathways that get around the block, and which has now turned out to be true of all kinase inhibitors. So you don't want to block specific kinases. So again, they're now looking at inhaled drugs. Now the last thing I'm going to mention is uh, something that we're interested in, and it's how you could possibly reverse steroid resistance in COPD, which is a major defining characteristic of the disease. Uh, and what we've defined as a pathway driven by oxidative stress, which is markedly increased in COPD, that activates PI3 kinase delta, which then phosphorylates uh, histone deacetylase 2, which we've shown is a key nuclear enzyme that mediates the anti-inflammatory effect of steroids to switch off activated inflammatory genes. And quite by chance, Kaz Ito, who led these studies, tested theophylline because we wanted to see if any drugs the COPD patients are treated with might affect the measurement of HDAC2. And the only one that did was theophylline. And this was in very low doses, much lower than you need for bronchodilatation, which was the primary purpose of theophylline in previous times. And theophylline is a highly specific and potent inhibitor of oxidant-activated PI3 kinase delta. And the plasma concentrations that achieve this are much lower than you would normally use in clinical practice. So avoid all of the side effects, which are mainly mediated by PDE4 inhibition. And this increases HDAC2 and reverses steroid resistance. But there are other drugs that do this. Nortriptyline was found by screening to enhance the effect of steroids, and we showed that it's working on exactly the same target. Nortriptyline is a, an old and very cheap antidepressant. Most people with COPD are depressed. Uh, and also, nortriptyline is working against nicotine addiction. So it does everything and costs nothing. And as I'm going to show you, macrolides also work on this target. And we set up a company at Imperial to develop inhaled PI3 kinase delta inhibitors. So these are more specifically targeting this. And all of these drugs reverse steroid resistance. And there are other drugs that do this as well. So we think this pathway is an important pathway to target. So theophylline in low therapeutic concentrations activates HDAC, and especially when the levels are reduced by oxidative stress, and it's through a novel mechanism. Um, and you can see here that the low HDAC that we see in the macrophages of COPD patients are increased by theophylline. Um, and th these are very low concentrations, so one micromolar is much less than you would normally use in the clinic when you give oral theophylline. So it's a remarkable effect of theophylline. 
And we didn't know how it worked, but we knew that it was working somewhere in the pathway. It's not an antioxidant, and it doesn't have a direct effect on HDAC2. So it was somewhere in the pathway, and we identified PI3 kinase delta. And if we look at PI3 kinase inhibitors, they have a similar effect of theophylline in, in increasing HDAC. And here you can see the effect of theophylline is in, it, it's increased in potency by a hundredfold by oxidant stress. So you may never find this unless you had the right cell assay system to do it. And this is the cell assay system that we've used to find new drugs, not by chemical screening of huge libraries with known targets, but by functional assays. And one very interesting drug is a, is a new macrolide called solithromycin. It's called the fourth generation macrolide. And I don't have time to go into the extraordinary properties of this new drug. Um, but you can see that solithromycin is increasing the steroid sensitivity of COPD cells. And it does this through increasing HDAC activity by inhibiting the phosphorylation of HDAC2. And it works by targeting oxidant-activated PI3 kinase. And we're just starting clinical studies with this drug. The last target I'm going to mention is NRF2, which is a key transcription factor, which is part of our defense against oxidative stress. So when a cell is exposed to oxidative stress, this leads to activation of NRF2 by releasing it from proteins like KEEP1, which normally keep it in the cytoplasm. But once it's released, it can go into the nucleus, and it switches on a 1,000 antioxidant and cytoprotective genes. And these genes encode for antioxidants, which counteract oxidative stress. So this defends us from oxidative stress. And if you knock out this gene in mice, and expose them to cigarette smoke, they get much worse emphysema. And Shyam Biswell has shown that in COPD patients, I think this was in a collaboration with Jim, uh, that there was no increase in NRF2. And what we found is that there's no increase in NRF2 with oxidative stress in COPD cells. And we've shown that's because NRF2 becomes hyperacetylated as a result of reduced HDAC2. So it's another consequence of the oxidant damage. Now you can overcome this with molecules that are NRF2 activators, and the classical molecule is sulforaphane, which occurs in broccoli. So your mother always told you that broccoli was good for you, and now you know why. And in this study with Sean Biswell, we showed that sulforaphane increases HDAC2, and increases HDAC activity in vivo in mice exposed to cigarette smoke, but doesn't work in mice with NRF2 gene knockout. So it's targeting NRF2. And many companies are now looking for NRF2 activators because it's very, been very difficult to find new antioxidants, which is what we need in COPD, uh, with the classical antioxidant approaches like glutathione, based drugs which are consumed by oxidative stress, so very unsatisfactory treatments. The problem with sulforaphane is that it's not very specific, it's rather toxic in high doses, and that led to the development of more specific drugs. This bar, bardoxalone methyl, previously known as CDDO, is a dreadful drug that has actually killed several people in clinical trials. And so this has now been stopped. And we're not surprised because it kills our epithelial cells when we put it on. So we were surprised that it ever got to a clinical trial. But there are other drugs that are in clinical trial. And a particular interest is dimethyl fumarate called BG12, um, which is now in phase three studies in multiple sclerosis for its antioxidant effect. And it's thought that this is relatively well tolerated. So there may be ways of activating NRF2. And many companies are looking for novel NRF2 activators. So the implications for new treatment, the pharmaceutical industry is looking for inflammatory targets like PD4. But these drugs 
have been so far disappointing because the dose is limited by side effects. And it's been very difficult to find inhaled drugs that work. So the alternative approach is to restore steroid sensitivity, and that involve, could involve repositioning of existing therapies like theophylline. Uh, it's been extremely difficult to get funding for this research because theophylline is very cheap. But finally, we've got a study uh, that is now started in the UK called TWIX, uh, which has now just started looking at low-dose oral theophylline in people with COPD on inhaled steroids. Uh, and a study in China looking at low-dose oral theophylline with low-dose oral steroid. Uh, prednisolone, 5 milligrams a day, is very well tolerated in China. Uh, and doesn't have significant side effects. This would be an extremely cheap treatment, and we have to just think of treatments that could be used on a global scale. So Lava-Lama combination inhalers will never be used in China, apart from people in the Communist Party, because they'll be too expensive. <laughs> we go think of cheap treatments. But there are other things like nortriptyline, macrolides, uh, and then new therapies, and this company that we... Uh, founded, Respivert, has now been taken over by Johnson & Johnson. And these drugs, particularly the PI3 kinase gamma delta inhibitors by inhalation, are now in phase two in COPD. And so far, they're very well tolerated. And we're waiting for the clinical results. So new drugs for COPD are very difficult to find. And what the best we've done so far is to get better bronchodilators which is not unimportant because it makes people feel better, but it doesn't address the underlying disease process for which we must have anti-inflammatory treatments. But very difficult to find antagonists of single mediators that are effective, and even CXCR2 antagonists that look so promising are doubtful. Uh, new anti-inflammatory drugs that have a broad spectrum have a lot of side effects, and this is true for all of the ones that have been tested. Uh, we studied an NF-kappa B inhibitor, which was extremely toxic, and we had to stop the study because people got so ill. And you can see P38 inhibitors have a problem, as do PD4 inhibitors. And now we're looking at PAN-JAK inhibitors, which are another promising target, but again, we don't know if it's going to be safe. And then finally, there's a new strategy, which is reversal of steroid resistance that could be relevant in many diseases, as well as COPD, like severe asthma, where you have steroid resistance, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease. And this could be done with existing treatments or drugs specifically designed to do this, like PI3 kinase delta inhibitors uh, or NRF2 activators. So I think there's a lot of promise for the future. Uh, to find new treatments, because then there really will be an argument to start these drugs very early in the course of the disease, before the inflammation destroys the lung. Thank you for your attention. One question here before we break for a short break. Uh, uh, Peter, I'm sure you'll appreciate uh, a UBC um, project was uh, the discovery of the SHIP pathway. And what uh, role do you think SHIP pathway may have in activating it in COPD? Well, um, I think the SHIP pathway is, a, is an endogenous inhibitor of the PI3 kinase pathway, so it could be of interest to reverse steroid resistance. But as you know, we, we've looked at this in monocytes, so we find quite small effects. So we, it may be that we're not looking at the right model. But I think it, you know these endogenous pathways are quite interesting to look at. I mean, another one which has been looked at is metformin, which is a very commonly used treatment for type 2 diabetes. P pretty well tolerated drug. And metformin uh, activates a kinase called AMP kinase, which inhibits mTOR, which is the downstream kinase of ACT, which is downstream of PI3 kinase. So it works on the same pathway, but lower down. So we think metformin has potential. And, and the good thing about metformin is that it prolongs life. It, it inhibits senescence. And these sort of drugs need to be looked at in the context of COPD because 
they would be well tolerated compared with some of the treatments we're using. I mean, metformin is a pretty safe treatment. Okay, I think we better have a break because everybody needs to stretch. So come back in 10 minutes.